as, as Sandy mentioned, so I'm Daniel Schiff. I'm an assistant professor. Um, other than what you mentioned, um, maybe worth noting that I've been in the AI ethics space for about 15 years. So I, during my undergraduate, I did a thesis called The Ethics of Artificial Intelligence. So back before AI ethics as a field. And at the time, some of my advisors are like, well, you know, what are you talking about? What is this? Uh, same thing when I started my PhD. I said, I think AI policy is, you know, is something we should be thinking about, but it wasn't really a field. Um, and now, you know, in the last five, six, seven years, AI policy has started to come into its own, and you know, in the last couple of years, more, more public awareness. Uh, and the, the premise of this talk here is looking at the connection between these two fields. So uh, kind of very interestingly, AI ethics has had a prominent place in the policy discourse. Um, but uh, a question is, is, is this ethical discourse, are these goals, are they translating into change, into policy action, into governance? And we have our own kind of, you know, maybe intuitions about this, or we hear things. I wanted to study this a little bit uh, more systematically. So today I'll just give, uh, you know, a little background and motivation for, you know, why we, you know, care about some of these kinds of things. Um, I'll focus on this, this case study. This is largely a qualitative case study of the U.S. AI policy agenda. Uh, and I'll get a little kind of policy wonkish here, so some policy frameworks and jargon, but I think there's no crazy statistics or anything like that. It should be hopefully quite accessible, but do feel free to interrupt me at any point with thoughts or clarifying questions. Um, this case study was 2016 through 2020. Um, these things moved pretty quickly. There have been a ton of developments in US AI policy even since then. So I'll take just a minute to reflect on where we are, but that's also something that we can turn to in the discussion at the end. And then just wanted to add, um, as we've done with the students uh, earlier today and with some of the grad students, um, we can chat about the US policy agenda, but we can also chat about other AI topics that are, that are on people's minds. So what's going on with generative AI? Uh, in the class this morning, I was talking about deep fakes, lots of conversations about AI and education, because there's a lot going on that we have to think about what's going on with corporate governance. So really happy to discuss anything that's on, on people's minds. Okay, so the executive order on safe, secure, and trustworthy AI, AI comes out from the Biden administration in October or November last year. So it's sort of the biggest, most substantive piece of US legislation to date. Before then, we had uh, this AI risk management framework. That was a voluntary framework. We had a White House uh, blueprint, AI Bill of Rights more uh, you know, guidance and frameworks, this adds a little bit of action. And some of the stuff you see in here uh, engages in what we might think of as, as framing or agenda setting. So you know, how do we shape the way that the public, the way that policymakers think about what we need to do about AI? What does AI mean? What are the problems? What are the solutions? And I start to see increasing language like, you know, AI is a new frontier. Uh, in, it enhances economic and national security. So we get some of this language around you know, innovation, around national security. Uh, moreover, it's instrumental to our strategic competition with China. So a sort of geopolitical lens has become, become quite popular. And we still get language like, uh, we must remain steadfast in mitigating risks, ensuring all Americans can benefit. So these are in efference, uh, essence, different ways of framing AI as a policy issue which could direct how we think about this. Uh, meanwhile, some of the legislative action that's happened, uh, we had the America Competes Act and the US Innovation and Competition Act, literally blending innovation and competition as connected concepts here. Now the Chips and Science Act is out. Uh, the House and Senate were fighting over some of the details. So what is the agenda here? Literally uh, fights between the legislators. More legislation like the Algorithmic Accountability Act uh, which has not gone through various deep fakes act, uh, acts, some interesting ones like the No Robot Bosses Act that have been proposed. So there's certainly more, you know, more action uh, here. So what is this all saying? Uh, in addition to this sort of largely just proposed legislation, there has been action or warning shots put out by the federal agencies, by the, by the uh, Federal Trade Commission, Department of Commerce, et cetera, where they might put out a blog post that says, you know, hey, you know, you're a bank and you're using AI in this way, just because you're using this fancy, these fancy neural networks doesn't mean you're exempt from uh, protecting vulnerable groups or our existing laws. So we don't know exactly how to regulate this yet, but you will be on the hook in housing and finance and consumer protection 
and so on. So the agencies have started to put things out. Some uh, US states, uh, subnational, even cities have put out their own legislation. I, th I mentioned right before, the Office of Science Technology Policy put out this AI Bill of Rights. And otherwise, we've had this uh, National Institute of Standards and Technology voluntary risk framework where companies can basically choose to use this, but they don't have to. And it says, oh, you need a risk management system. OK. So essentially, uh, the term we would use here is a, a policy window. You say a, a window is open for AI policy to, to become formed, to change, to set, set the direction. And this is potentially especially important because sometimes when we put a policy into place, it kind of gets locked in. And you know, maybe you change it, maybe 10 years later something else happens, but a lot of the early course can be set and create a path dependence. Uh, so we have an open policy window where we are shaping the agenda. A very, very quick background that I think most of you will not need, but essentially we have uh, growth in big data, some uh, advancements in algorithms, more processing power, so big advances in AI in the 2010s. And this led to a kind of massive industry adoption uh, calls for governance. So the, the big tech companies used to be mobile first, and then they were cloud first, and now they're all AI first. Right? All of our big companies are heavily invested in AI. Uh, and we've started to see calls about ethical, legal, social implications in, in every sector, in housing, in healthcare, in criminal justice, in dating apps, in trade, in international development. So a big question here is, Lots of benefits, lots of risks, open questions. How do we govern emerging technologies? Uh, this is not generative pre-trained transformer. This is not chat GPT. This is a general purpose technology. So uh, the idea being AI can do many, many different things. It can be applied to different sectors. So it's sort of broadly impactful and powerful. So uh, it also has a strategic dimension, big economic impact, big potential military impact. So how are we going to govern these strategic uh, emerging general purpose technologies? Some of the questions. Should we centralize this? Should we have a, a big central new AI office that studies everything like the European Union has? Or should we have it be decentralized? Uh, is it too soon to regulate because everything's moving and we don't know enough yet? Or do we need to do it now? Uh, to what extent is self-regulation effective? Or do we need external formal regulation or both? Are we coordinating across countries? Are we competing? Um, are we taking a more precautionary stance or a more pro-innovation stance? Uh, and then I just added this one recently. Should we open source all of our AI models so everyone can see them and use them? Or should we keep this all protected with only the top companies that have a bunch of safety and ethics researchers to make sure they're safe? So a bunch of governance questions like this that we need to sort of be tackling. Uh, and one way I've been thinking about this is you know, are we going to approach technology policy, technology governance, in sort of some of the ways we traditionally have, or are we going to do something a little bit different here? Uh, kind of follow-up question here is, what is the AI policy agenda? It started to emerge. There's documents. There's frameworks. There's hearings. Some things have come to the forefront. So what actually will be the agenda? And who's shaping the agenda? Uh, which actors have power in the policy process? Is it industry? Do researchers have a voice? Does the public have much of a voice? Uh, and the way that this, this paper sort of plays out, I look at uh, what we call issue frames or policy frames. So some of that language I showed you at the very beginning, is this about economic advancement and innovation? Is this about social and ethical harms and protecting the public? Is this about competing with China and the US, you know, beating out its competitors? Or if I'm some uh, smaller country, maybe I want a piece of the pie and I need to get in, get in there. Um, and then, yeah, again, instead of who has, who has influence, experts, industry, the public, who has really voice in this story here. So I'll walk you through a little framework that I sort of put together to help think about AI as an object of policy study. What does it mean to study AI? So a few things we might think about it, um, as I've mentioned just before. This is what we consider an emerging technology. Uh, so even though it's been around since the 50s and before, um, it's this category, it's very dynamic, it impacts a lot of things. General purpose meaning it can be used in many, many different ways, right? Robotics, autonomous vehicles, uh, uh, recommendation algorithms and social media, and these strategic implications. So from this, we can uh, infer a couple things. 
One just has ubiquitous, pervasive types of impact, right? It impacts all sectors and spaces. I think at this point there are papers and reports on all of this stuff. Uh, so cross-cutting impacts and also dual use implications. Uh, and I don't mean dual use just in the, that there's a maybe a couple different sense of this. I just mean dual use in that it could be used for good things or bad things. It could be used, it could be misused. Uh, and you know, as a result of some of these characteristics, again, massive economic implications, a percentage growth to GDP, we hear these kinds of numbers, military implications offensively and defensively, ethical and social issues. So all of these things play out. At the same time, there's a lot of uncertainty uh, and ambiguity associated with AI. So we know there are costs and benefits, but not exactly what they are. Is this gonna help our students learning or is it gonna undermine it? Uh, when is it gonna help jobs or hurt jobs? Uh, is this gonna make war better and safer or worse? So unclear costs and benefits, because it's in so many different sectors of society, different people might care about it in different ways. Maybe if I'm in one portion of the population, I care about predictive policing. Maybe if I'm in another portion, I care about AI in the financial system or AI taking away art that's part of my job. So it matters in different ways to different people. And I'll just attach that to this idea of fluid participation. Uh, who are the interest groups? Who are the people who will vote or donate or whatever it is that we are uh, worried about? This is gonna change depending on where you are and which industries are affected. The healthcare, uh, what we would call policy subsystem versus the criminal justice policy subsystem, different sets of actors. So quite complex. Uh, and then finally, this idea of framing contestation. So not only do we have this you know, innovation story and this ethics story, uh, people might be fighting about which one is the real story, who should really be shaping what we're talking about, uh, what are the primary goals. So I think because AI is so general, it lends itself to this kind of contestation, creating a kind of high stakes uh, policy ambiguity that actors are working to settle out. So sort of big questions here. Uh, what are the issues that are dominating the emerging US agenda and who or what is influencing it? That was the core motivation for this study, which is quite uh, descriptive in nature. Okay. So I mentioned that there may be sort of competing visions of how technology governance, how technology policy should go. And I have a kind of very simple heuristic here. I have two options, probably not a fully robust characterization, but one version we might think of is the traditional approach in innovation policy, so science, technology, and innovation policy, uh, economic development. And this would traditionally be focusing on strategic economic development, on uh, geopolitical positioning. Uh, it would be very pro-innovation. Uh, experts would have a really big role here in shaping the story. So they'd be participating in the congressional committees or the hearings, or they would be the expert groups that are called upon. And we see this kind of language in uh, for example, the Office of Management and Budget, which put out some executive documents previously, uh, to federal agencies. They said, agencies must avoid a precautionary approach, including regulatory or non-regulatory actions that needlessly hamper AI innovation and growth. So this is a very pro-innovation stance. And um, I wanna say it was you know, building American leadership in AI, maybe that, that executive order. On the other hand, um, I'm terming here the, the transformative approach, the sort of alternative perspective on uh, technology policy. So here you might think we have a heightened priority on social and ethical risks. Um, we're acknowledging that there are downsides of innovation. It's not always a good thing. And there's this idea of involving the public voice more. We really need the public to be part of the governance story, not just the experts. Uh, so an example of uh, White House uh, I think another executive order, United States must foster public trust and confidence in AI technologies and protect civil liberties, privacy, and American values. So a little bit of a different take. And we see these coming out of different countries and different documents and whatnot. Uh, and I would say that there are other um, paradigms here, responsible research and innovation, a mission-oriented innovation policy that kind of have this approach. We need more of uh, a uh, polycentric governance, we need more involvement, we need civil society here. But I've sort of simplified it into these two uh, extremes to help understand the direction that we're taking. So simple descriptive question, does the US federal AI policy agenda better reflect the traditional approach or the transformative approach? And then second question is, you know, why is it taking this trajectory? 
What, what has caused this, given the policy ambiguity and the contested frames? What is it about the policy process or the context that's leading to this result? A little bit of a tougher question, but trying to get a little bit of insight here at least. Okay, um, so let me turn to the, the traditional, excuse language, uh, policy framework that I've used to help uh, understand this. So this is a very prominent framework in we call policy process theory, understanding how policies get made, called the multiple streams framework, used to understand agenda setting, the agenda setting process. And essentially, we imagine that there are uh, there'll be three streams, but one stream is where the problems emerge in society. Um, so you know, you have a lot of poverty, you have healthcare issues, you have loneliness, you have car accidents. Uh, important thing here is that problems are not just given to us objectively. Uh, to some extent, they're, uh, they're socially constructed. They're argued for. Who decides whether too much or too little immigration is the real problem? Uh, or someone getting taxed too much or too little is the real problem? People fight to articulate and define what the real problem is. And that plays a big role, a problem definition. And here we, we see things like uh, statistical indicators usually. So I show the poverty numbers, I show the percentage of students who are cheating. Oh, there's my evidence. I have indicators of the real problems. And then something called focusing events, which is kind of what it sounds like. An airplane crash. Something's going on at Boeing. Uh, you know, ransomware attacks. We need better cybersecurity. Uh, stock market crash. Something's going wrong in the financial system. So these are kinds of things that lead to uh, us to identify what the problems are or to argue. Same time, we have what's called the, the policy stream or the solution stream. So this is the flip side. How do we, how do we fix things? Uh, so, well, maybe we need universal uh, health care, or maybe we need to privatize health care more. Um, uh, maybe we need to open trade up or close it, you know, whatever solution we have. We need, we need more STEM education. We need more liberal arts education. And here, some of the factors that shape the solutions are terms that we call technical feasibility. So, um, I can't give everyone a supercomputer. Uh, but I could give everyone a laptop. Um, I might not be able to, I might not have the money to provide uh, every elderly American with $10 million of health care, so maybe that's not quite feasible. That's not going to pass the budget office. So there's a, a political and technical feasibility question, and there's a question of, we call it value acceptability. Uh, if I say, let's abolish all the borders, that's not going to be something that Congress is going to even bother talking about. So these are, are things that will condition solutions that we consider viable. Okay, and one of the important factors here is that the solutions don't come after the problems. We don't identify the problems and then solve them and then pass bills. These things are argued for at the same time. People are coming up with solutions and then they're looking for problems, which we call problem surfing. Uh, not always, but the idea is these are sort of independent groups of experts who are coming up with, we need more funding, we need more health care, and then they're waiting for the right moment, the right uh, crisis event to argue that it's time. Third stream, a politics stream, essentially there's a political opening. So maybe there's a new election, maybe public opinion has turned, uh, and then when all of these things converge, and we call a, a, a big problem has emerged, or there's an, like an election, something like that, we get a window, uh, we have actors that come along called policy entrepreneurs, the people who are sort of making these arguments. And what they will do is they will couple problems and solutions uh, and try to put them on the agenda. And they'll use different strategies. So they, they'll use their resources or their access. They'll do lobbying. They'll go to hearings. They'll engage in issue framing, which we talked about a little bit, coalition building, things like that. So they'll couple the problems and solutions. They'll go to Congress or whatever it is and they'll put something on the agenda. So that's the logic of this framework. And then we have the question, with all of this happening in AI, are we getting something closer to the traditional approach or the transformative approach or neither, something else, aspects of both? So this is the framework I've used to sort of uh, operationalize the, the, these research questions. Okay, so uh, the methodology here. So what I essentially did was look at 63 uh, key AI documents coming out of the, the, the US federal government. Uh, these are all helpfully put on um, uh, AI.gov. It had a different URL back then, but they're official documents broken into different categories. 
curated by the White House AI Initiative over a four-year period. So many of them are scientific or technical reports, strategy documents, uh, requests for information, uh, event summaries, ethical principles, international declarations, budgets, uh, things like that. So majority are reports and strategy documents, but quite a diverse group. And the idea is that these documents are an important and meaningful reflection of official policy stances. Uh, so there's, you, know, you could listen to members of Congress on Twitter, you could listen to you know, President's State of the Union speech, but this is a lot of different agencies that are saying, this is what AI is, this is what we need to do, this is how we understand it, so we can infer something about what the agenda is. Uh, and there's questions, you know, is this, is this cheap talk? You know, is this the only source to understand this? And it, no, it's certainly not. But it should be a reflection of, you know, not just the ideas, but the competing ideas and which ideas have won out. Um, presumably there are committees working on this, they're hearing from people and they've said, these are the real problems. So this is the source I use to sort of articulate the agenda. And to give you a feel for some of the documents, uh, the intelligence community has its own AI ethics principles. Uh, this was NIST's early plan uh, in developing technical standards and related tools, 2019. Department of Homeland Security, uh, Government Accountability Office, Emerging Opportunities, Challenges, and Implications. Right, so there, what are the problems, what are the opportunities? Uh, Health and Human Services, their strategy, USAID, their strategy, so 63 documents like these uh, of different varieties. Okay, so analysis approach here is uh, relatively straightforward. This is essentially a, a single case study, uh, primarily qualitative document analysis or content analysis, a little bit of quantitative work, so some trends or averages and things like that, but no natural language processing here. So I coded a total of 4,100 paragraphs. I think this was about 4,000 pages uh, to figure out uh, its coverage of different policy problems or solutions or frames. And then I do some normalization to make sure that big documents aren't getting too much weight in the study compared to small documents, so some sort of normalization techniques. Uh, and then I engage in conceptually pattern matching based on these frameworks that I've just shown you. So how do these documents map onto the multiple streams framework, problems, solutions, entrepreneurs, and this transformative or traditional policy paradigm. Where, where are these sort of lining up? So I end up with a, a code book, right, a set of categories that looks kind of like this. So you see, for example, uh, focusing events and indicators are part of our problem stream. Traditionally, uh, focusing events related to the military or geopolitics. China's put out this new strategy, what do we do? They have a new uh, weapon. Uh, indicators related to advances in AI capabilities. So more traditional. On the other hand, transformative examples, maybe I have uh, the Netherlands welfare scandal where the government resigned. Maybe I have someone who's uh, unfairly arrested due to faulty facial recognition and that gets news press. So a sort of transformative focusing event or indicator. Issue frames, I use three, uh, innovation, geopolitics, and ethics. Sort of, you know, innovation or geopolitics are probably here, and then, you know, uh, ethical issue frame more on this side. And then problems, traditional ones might be like, we don't have enough data, we need more data to compete. Uh, and transformative ones would be more like, there are novel human rights concerns we have to think about. Solutions, same. We need more computer scientists, we need more STEM education, we need worker retraining very traditional supply side uh, transformative innovation logic. Transformative maybe we need novel ways to include vulnerable groups in the discussion. And sort of, again kind of crassly, experts part of the traditional paradigm with imagining the public as more of the transformative paradigm. So again this is just kind of a heuristic but this is how I separated and coded these categories to uh, tell this story. Okay so what did I find here uh, across these documents? So this is, uh, these graphs are showing the coverage of focusing events and indicators uh, across the documents here. Uh, this is the percentage of focusing events, uh, again, with this sort of normalization approach. Uh, traditional is in red and transformative is in blue. I'll tell you a little bit about them. Uh, so despite lots of AI ethics in the news, some of the most prominent news stories, um, in media talking about these you know, issues related to algorithmic bias or whatnot, a lot of 
experts, academics kind of warning about these issues. Uh, there's an overwhelming focus on very traditional indicators and focusing events. There are no statistics about poverty increasing. There's none of that. There are statistics about you know, uh, uh, labor disruption or economic growth opportunities. So it was, let's see, 96% of focusing events and 84% of indicators were what I put in the traditional category. This surprised me a little bit, given all the, the discourse out there, that it was you know, seemingly quite lopsided in this way. Uh, so the, uh, the bureaucrats who are writing these documents, they are not talking about, there's this algorithmic bias scandal, here's what we need to do about it. They're talking about economic potential, um, competition with other actors, China put out its new strategy, Russia put out its new strategy, what do we do about this? Okay. Going to the three issue frames here, uh, let me just give a couple examples. So this is uh, Bill Foster, who's been pretty active. He says, artificial intelligence is at the forefront of innovation, changing the way Americans operate in the marketplace. I'm excited to chair the uh, FSC Dems, AI Task Force, Financial Services Committee, and better understand how developments in AI will affect businesses and consumers. That kind of an innovation story. Uh, on the other hand, this is uh, Yvette Clark, who was a, I want to say, yeah, co-sponsor of the Algorithmic Accountability Act. Algorithms determine whether we're hired, sent to jail, approved for a mortgage, but can result in discrimination. Proud to introduce this act with uh, Ron Wyden and, and Cory Booker to regulate algorithms and bias tech tools. So ethics story. And then here's uh, Marco Rubio in 2018. While we spend our time fighting each other, a China-centric technology future is taking shape. If we don't wake up and get moving, China will be setting global standards for AI, gene editing, 5G, uh, et cetera. So this is sort of, I think, representative of these different stories. Uh, I've also had the chance to download all of the tweets from federal legislators over this time period and look at which of these frames they're using over time uh, and if it's matching public and media sentiment. Uh, that's a paper that should be coming out soon. I'm happy to chat about that also. Okay, but how do these issue frames appear in these documents? Well, you know, kind of interesting here. Um, there is a, a lot of documents that will cover all three of these frames at least once. So there's, you know, some mention of all of these issues. Uh, so innovations in the red here, ethics is here. So a lot of documents talk about both innovation and ethics, uh, not as much strictly in the geopolitical domain. Uh, compared to Congress, which is all about um, US and China competition, uh, the, the, the Innovation Competition Act had like 900 mentions of China or something like that. Uh, not as many in these documents. Uh, but you know, even though there's this overlap, the sort of primary frame, the dominant frame in 40 of the 63 documents is still innovation. And what I would say about the ethics documents is a lot of it did reside just at the mission statement level. So a lot of documents will say in their, their front pages and their executive summaries, great benefits, great harms, you need to protect uh, civil rights, all of this kind of stuff. Uh, but then when you get down to the, the work plan uh, and the strategic plan and you know, we're gonna meet these three months with these committees, uh, then it would be innovation strategies. So the sort of idea here is that ethics became a little bit instrumentalized to other goals. Now, I'll give you an example quote. Trustworthiness of AI systems, this ethical sort of goal that's commonly used in AI discourse, is a key factor for the diffusion and adoption of AI, essential to turning AI trustworthiness into a competitive parameter in the global marketplace. And you'll see this in the EU AI Act, you see this all over the US. We need Americans to trust AI so they'll adopt it, so we can innovate more and accelerate AI. Yeah? Could you just help me read this uh, graph? So the central sure. uh, overlapping area, is that a document that would have touched upon all geopolitics, ethics, and innovation? That's there? right, that's right, okay, yeah. so uh, got it. And it's a pretty crass metric. This is just one or more mentions, really. Gotcha. Okay. So this is why I sort of, oh, I need to go a little bit deeper into what the, the dominant frame is. That's what I was trying yeah. to figure out. Is like innovation dominant if it's mentioned in line with all these others, but I guess if it's exclusively mentioned as well, it's perhaps more dominant, but as well. As yeah, I don't think it was quite, quite the best way to uh, maybe visualize this, but on a high level, all of the frames are part of the story, but in terms of like what's really driving, yeah, in innovation was still quite, quite prominent. Sure. Uh, so yeah, so this, this connection between trust and adoption, um, yeah, right, even into a, a competition phrase, 
So if we build AI more ethically than China again, you know, we'll outcompete them and people will buy our products. And other countries um, in Europe have used the same logic. They said we can be, Finland can be the responsible AI home and that'll be our competitive advantage. Denmark has said this. Okay, so the you know, question here is, is there some kind of meaningful synthesis where all of these stories are coming together and we're doing ethics and innovation at the same time? Or is ethics being kind of subsumed into the innovation story? All right, um, well, let's look at the policy problem, see if that provides any more insight. Uh, so we have a lot of uh, a, a problem that I, I ended up kind of having to code called realizing benefits. The problem here is that we don't have enough AI, we're not adopting fast enough, other people might be doing it, but you know, we need to realize these benefits. Not what you would typically think of as a policy problem, but I felt that was you know, only appropriate here. Security and military, workforce and education. So again, you can see the top problems are these traditional uh, you know, red problems in nature. 49 of them mention workforce and education goals. Uh, 54 mention security or military goals. Uh, there is some you know, solid coverage of transformative type problems. So value alignment, fairness and bias, inequality and inclusion, uh, uh, vulnerable populations. So 25 mentioned human rights. These are across all of these executive agencies. That's quite interesting. 28 inequality or inclusion, 41 mentioned fairness or bias. It's the most prominent ethics related issue in AI, but less often. So of all the problems coded in these 4,100 paragraphs, only 16% of them are uh, transformative type problems, as, as I've coded them. Uh, and again, kind of more shallow mentions. So I say, and we need to preserve fairness. And then I have five pages on my STEM internship fellowship rotation strategy. Um, so, so disproportionate coverage. I also ended up with this, this odd category that I didn't anticipate creating. I ended up calling them hybrid categories, so hence the purple. Uh, and what these were, were essentially categories that you might have thought of as traditional ethics issues, privacy, transparency, trust. But the way that these uh, ideas were rendered in the documents was a little bit surprising. So it was no longer about uh, you know, protecting individuals' rights to privacy. It became very technical. It became, uh, we'll apply differential privacy techniques and use synthetic data. Um, you know, we'll look at uh, interpretable algorithms to deal with black box AI. So it sort of lost the lens of the, the human touch. So I wrote this as an absence of human-centered language. So they no longer had the same tenor as some of the other transformative problems. And there's some interesting you know, interpretations of this. So is this, uh, uh, does this mean that we finally operationalize these concepts to the level that they're, they're technically tractable? You know, maybe we're no longer just sort of, oh, human rights is great. Now we have privacy solutions. And now we're being concrete, and that's progress. Or does this mean that we're sort of losing a little bit of the, the broader story, and we're now treating trust as, oh, we get trust, so we get adoption. So I wasn't quite sure what to think about these, but they're so, somewhere in the middle of, of uh, transformative and traditional. Uh, and you know, if I was going to take away one interpretation, it would be that the, the way they're positioned and framed, the paragraphs that are inserted into, they're closer to the traditional way of thinking about innovation. I need to make AI safe so it's adopted more, or things like that. Okay, yeah, so as I said, you know, is this, is this representing a productive synthesis where all these, we're, we're doing ethics finally in government and we know how to do it, or is this, you know, we're sort of losing, losing the plot a little bit and we're, uh, this is becoming subsumed into innovation. Okay, a couple more. Uh, so policy solutions, another big one. Um, R&D, data quality, workforce. You can see again the very traditional uh, uh, strategies here. Research and development donations, we, data access, we need more data. Huge one across most of the documents. More STEM training, these ones dominated. A little bit uh, in the transformative category, but not a ton. And then there's a lot of categories that are a bit vague. So someone says, we need b better standards. Well, standards for what? And those, those could be ethical standards, those could be safety standards. Uh, impact assessment, well, what types of impacts are you measuring? Often not specified. 
or we need better government monitoring of AI systems. So again, a little bit of ambiguity in, in some of those. Um, okay. Uh, so yeah, so depending on how these policy solutions are designed, they could instantiate social and ethical goals really, really well. Uh, they could make them concrete. They could make them measurable as, as much as it can be. They could make it enforceable with fines. So they could take ethics really seriously, or they could sort of pull it out and only be uh, operationalizing a small number of things. So I think that was a, was a little bit of an open story, how this, how this unfolds, what, uh, uh, what will be the details of these that are operationalized. Okay, last kind of big descriptive analysis here. Uh, who's shaping the story, uh, the public or experts? And what I did here was just look at the mentions of public and the mentions of experts uh, in the same paragraphs that I coded as policy solutions to see who was mentioned the most. Uh, and you know, upon normalizing, the public is generally cited with respect to cooperation and dialogue. Uh, so we need public voice, we need diverse participation, et cetera, et cetera. But again, when you get into the work plans and the task forces and the funding strategies, it's industry and government actors working together. So the public really heavily drops out. So you get timelines, deliverables, new staff roles, government, you know, cross-governmental, and industry participation, some academic participation, the public is largely only in those mission statements. Uh, for example, one of the uh, categories of the multiple streams framework was public opinion. That's meant to play a big role in shaping the agenda. I found maybe one mention of public opinion in all of the documents, despite the fact that we have done now many, many surveys and experiments and we've said, Every, every government document, every industry document says we want public voice, we want diverse voice, we need interdisciplinary voice. There is actually no attention to public opinion uh, in terms of shaping priorities. So this struck me as uh, uh, you know, a clear absence. There's no articulation of our strategy is gonna have a, 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 a citizens assembly where we meet and talk about these issues and they're gonna help guide us. It was just notion, notional at the beginning of the documents. So this is a, yeah, a, clear, a clear gap to me here. Okay, so a couple kind of takeaways here. One is that a lot of the, uh, the transformative goals, the ethical goals, they may still lack what we would consider technical feasibility. And to give you an example, this is a, uh, the standards body NIST 2019 document. While stakeholders expressed broad agreement that societal and ethical considerations must factor into AI standards, it is not clear how that should be done and whether there is yet sufficient scientific and technical basis to develop these standards provisions. So European Union, NIST, they've all been tasked with creating technical standards for fairness. Uh, there are bunches of different metrics that are used to optimize algorithms to make them fair by certain ways. This is a really hard thing. This is fairness, justice. These are contested concepts in political philosophy. Um, we have findings that if you maximize one notion of fairness, you can't maximize other notions of fairness. Um, this is really complicated, and I've been sitting in some standards bodies. I was secretary of the IEEE 7010 standard, which is the impact of AI on human well-being. is the first AI ethics industry standard. Back then, we didn't think that we could create technical standards for ethics, so it's more of a socio-technical process framework. Five or six years later, I'm still curious to see if you know, now that the EU has passed this act and they've said uh, to their standards bodies, uh, SEN, Senelec, Etsy, now you guys have to make the standards and that's what's really gonna drive stuff. Are they gonna come up with standards for fairness? Uh, so that's gonna be interesting to watch. Back then, weren't sure how this is gonna be done, still not sure how this is gonna be done. So maybe we just don't know how to do ethics in this way, under this lens. Other set of solutions may not fit value acceptability. So to give you an example here, a lot of what is done in AI ethics is what you might consider technically tractable. So if we're gonna do anything, you know, privacy, we have measures and techniques, we have statistical measures of algorithmic bias, not power and inequality and long-term effects, but we can do some of these kinds of simple things that I can do a test of an algorithm and say, is it spitting out racially biased predictions? I can do that. Now can I say the nature of global trade is unfair and companies are having too much power? Well, that suddenly becomes too politically controversial. So 
maybe some of these solutions are getting squeezed out because they're not in the, 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 the window of acceptable solutions. So not feasible, not acceptable. Or another way I've been thinking about this is uh, they may be outside of what existing uh, agencies can think about or do. I'll give an example. So if I'm in <coughs> uh, the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, so I think about cars, I think about safety. I think about you know, environmental standards. I think about safety standards. Uh, I don't think about labor disruption. If five million truck drivers lose their jobs, that's not, my, that's not my responsibility. I just need to make sure the cars are safe. So whose job is it to think about the labor disruption? Uh, so they're understanding these issues in the lens that they traditionally think. Uh, and I think, right, they have, they have inertia, they have their, their own uh, expertise, what they have their official scope and what they understand their scope to be, their ways of working. These all translate things narrowly. And I think as a consequence, who does look at the broader issues that don't fit neatly into an agency line? So we may not have the right venues to take on uh, bigger collective issues that can't be solved within healthcare or within housing or whatnot. So these are just some reasons I think we might be seeing uh, the US policy agenda take this in a little bit more traditional shape. Values, feasibility, our policy venues not being able to think about this uh, robustly or comprehensively. Okay, so on the one hand, uh, the coverage of ethics is remarkable. You know, almost every document is talking about ethics every national AI policy strategy. I have some work on this across you know, several dozen countries. They all have ethics chapters or ethics paragraphs. Ethics is like really dominant in AI discourse and this is novel compared to you know, cryptography, internet, nanotechnology, uh, has much more prominent and more rapid coverage of ethics. So maybe if, if you're you know, part of this camp, you think this is a great success. So on the one hand, a great success, but on the other hand, when I you know, look at these documents you know, closely, uh, I think in many ways, at least these actors, are defaulting to traditional ways of working, traditional understandings of, of technology policy and governance. So that would be kind of the high level takeaway here. So you know, arguably there is an unprecedented change in focus. It's really new how we're talking about this stuff, but not really something like a paradigm shift. We're not doing AI in a new transformative, holistic, shared governance way. We, we, we're talking about it. We're not really doing it. We don't know really how to do it. Okay, so let me bring this four years in the future. You know, have things changed since then? Okay, so one possibility is these uh, we call policy image, just this overall story. Maybe this is solidifying. We kind of we kind of this is what AI policy is going to be. Uh, we have these frames that have merged together. You know, we we have uh, trust and safety to build innovation, and we're going to beat out our foreign competitors. Maybe we have a story and we just sort of advanced. Uh, on the other hand, last couple of years, we've had some, some focusing events, right? Some disruption. Okay, so misinformation is a big thing that's getting a lot of attention. This year is gonna be a little bit crazy. Labor disruption, who knows how this will go in the next five or 10 or 20 years. Uh, we have now calls or requirements for some of the big AI companies. Uh, they, they agreed to have auditing done they created something called the Frontier Model Forum, and the UK and Korea have AI safety institutes. Uh, the US created an AI safety institute that my lab is a, a member of. Uh, so maybe we have new lenses and new frames that are, are disrupting the conversation again, and there are gonna be new, new windows for policy action, as well as issues with uh, heightened salience, heightened public attention. Open versus closed source, you know, what, do we, what do we do about this? Do we, do we open these large language models? Um, within the, the AI community, are we focused on sort of long-term safety issues? Are we focused on shorter term um, issues related to inequality or bias? Uh, certainly lots of attention to big tech and are they, are they, are they too big? Are they too powerful? Do we moderate them? Um, this is a, there's some bipartisan agreement fighting this. So there are different, like, there are different issues and windows that may still disrupt AI policy. Not totally clear to me that it has uh, completely solidified. But this is at least kind of the direction I saw from these documents. Um, so I think that's basically it. Um, I popped up some, so these are some recent papers. I'm happy to chat about misinformation or education. Uh, this is this paper here, um, how state legislators are thinking about these issues. Uh, so happy to yeah, chat about the paper. 
um, or other AI questions that are on your mind. And uh, thanks so much for uh, listening to me. Kind of your last point there. So it's the cynical part of me is worried that the every reference to safety is just window dressing. And even in this kind of as we shift forward in time, even the idea like, oh, we're supporting some kind of a, a certain amount of oversight and we're involved in, in government panels and things like that. The cynical part of me is like, well, that's just window dressing, so they can keep working on the innovation side and go in the traditionalist approach to and ignore. And I'm wondering. Is that cynicism? <laughs> do, you, do you share that cynicism, or is there kind of hope that there's kind of a serious move toward worry about ethics? So it's it's complicated. I think you're right in a lot of ways, and I'm still either remaining hopeful or remaining vigilant. Maybe is the the right term here. Uh, so I think if if I were to ask you or to have asked myself before I started this, what do I think? What's probably going to happen? What I think is going to happen? It may have been the innovation story. I didn't want to don't want to bias my own research, of course, but I did want to do it empirically to see what's, what's happening to the, the best of my ability. Uh, so a little mixed, right? Like I, there is an innovation story. Uh, there is ethics washing and safety washing, I think definitely going on. Hard to know which actors are doing what, but I think there are a lot of actors that are very genuinely motivated too. So I've mentioned to some of you, I, I spent a year in uh, uh, industry working at a, a big company building their response by AI initiative and something like a quarter of the data scientists came to our ethics workshops, not required or anything. Tons of people emailed, they wanted to be part of an initiative, they wanted to do good stuff. Uh, Google and Microsoft have 150-ish response by AI people doing some of the best, most thoughtful, um, uh, meaningful research here. So I think there's a lot of you know, goodwill and genuine intentions, uh, and we've made progress. I think getting ethics on the agenda uh, has counted for stuff. Uh, the fact that there's an AI Safety Institute at all. Um, there have been bans of certain technologies. So, uh, so I don't think it's sort of a monolithic story, I guess. You know, even if innovation is kind of the primary story, there's a lot of actors at a lot of different levels that have, I think, had positive impact. And you know, uh, you know, if the goal is to kind of avoid the, the, the worst outcomes or you know, one-sided outcomes, I think it's requiring kind of constant vigilance, tracking issues, thinking about them, pushing for things that people believe in or people need. So, you know, definitely understand the cynicism, but as I said, trying to remain hopeful or if not, you know, against technological determinism, you know, make the changes ourselves that, that we see. Yeah. Um, yes. Please. Oh, sorry, Sandy. Didn't mean to take over your moderation duties. So so in terms of sort of scoping out the shape of the territory of federal policy, like, you know, it's certainly helpful to say, okay, these are the issues, these are, these are the documents, these are the agencies, you know, this is what's out there. Um, and in terms of, you know, just like a first take at, uh, you know, what is the, where is the em emphasis? I mean, because from, 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 from one side of me, one's supposed to think that, that, you know, that they're pushing sort of utility first you know, doesn't come as a big surprise. <laughs> even, even, I, you know, I, I, if, if I if I want to have a sympathetic interpretation, I could I could I could give it a sympathetic interpretation to that. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. but I, I I guess I have I guess I have a, a, a question and kind of a, another line of thought. Sure. So the question has to do with with salience, um, and this mm. is method methodological, mm. Mm. Um, and that is to say that. Uh, Okay, so we have the number of mentions, you know, but but just in the scheme of things, you know, it's entirely plausible that 95% of the mentions are things with 1% salience, and 5% of the mentions are things with you know 25% salience, and, and and therefore the whole whole coding system, you know, um, uh, it, that that's just a sort of methodological. Yep, concern. yep, yep. But I want to come back from from another from another side now, and that is to say that. It seems to me that it's going to be no surprise that it's going to be government and industry together that are in the room because they're the ones who, who have the resources and for whom it's immediately relevant. Um, and when you talk about having like, like public panels and all that, you know, there would be so many steps. And then, and then, and then you know, how, would he, how would you have even confidence that it would ever even make a difference, right? 
Um, and so this gets back to the question of, of salience. And on the one hand, um, you know, each of these agencies, you know, when you put them up, the military thing, the security thing, the privacy thing, we can all think of things that are relevant there, right? Um, but in terms of, of uh, knowing that, that the players in the room have certain interests, right? And that, you know, when industry comes to the table, when government comes to the table, that, that, that to some extent, um, you know, we can guess that, uh, um, you know, a housing company is going to want, want to sell more houses. That, that a, a, a pharmaceutical company is going to have more, going to have more profits, right? Um, and so, so to some extent, uh, another way to come at this would be to sort of do a scan of the problem territory, and and just these are things where, where it's not mm -hmm. as though there's any any kind of metric. You know, it's not yep, as like, yep. like, oh, this problem in, in like relations with China and this problem in healthcare, this one is a five and this one is a two, right? But, but even without any kind of clear metrics, it seems as though it would be possible to just do some kind of scanning exercise that would identify, you know, what seem to be 20 or 30 of the like social problems, uh, problematic outcomes. And this might be related to what, you, what you've already talked about in terms of events. But, but, but starting from there, and then sort of working backwards um, in terms of, um, well, uh, so what's going on with this problem? Like, is, is it a problem where there's the wrong incentives? Is it a problem mm, where, mm -hmm. um, uh, just, why is it you know, a problem? No thought about it. Right. Um, and, then, and then seeing how, these, how this, these, these problems scan back to the structure of the federal uh, Regulation, regulation approaches, and just seeing if there are any mm -hmm. issues. Um, Disconnects or right, yeah, right. I, I mean, really great insights. Uh, so let me see. If, take this in reverse order. See, so yeah, I, th I think a lot of the first few years of the AI ethics discourse was was problem identification. What are the social and ethical risks? This uh, paper at the at the bottom was kind of similar to this one, looking at a, a bunch of different documents across countries, public sector, private sector, what are they articulated as the problems? And then, you know, moving forward a little bit, now we're starting to come up with what we think are maybe solutions or past legislation. Uh, and this is gonna be very dynamic, right? You know, we think this is a problem and how much is it really? And maybe we're fixing it so it isn't as much of a problem, but actually tracking what happens when we start using AI in criminal justice or housing or healthcare. Um, that, that's, you know, that's also, also happening, but early stages, so still a lot of agenda setting and tinkering with policies. Um, you asked about uh, uh, sort of mapping actors and power and, and stuff like that. So yeah, so funny, so uh, one of my PhD students and I are working on a kind of uh, landscape mapping exercise. Who are all the actors that are testifying at hearings or applying for comments? There's good natural language techniques you could you know, uh, play around with to look at. What are their stances? Um, can you cluster their stances to see who's in which coalition or which coalitions seem to be uh, most similar to a change between a draft and a final version? So trying to think about ways to measure power and influence. Uh, and that's been tricky. Um, I did have one study where we did an experimental study with state legislators. Uh, this uh, sending them different messages from civil society and seeing which, which messages, what strategies influence them. So there, there are ways to look at this descriptively as well as maybe experimentally. I think actually Jonah has a project that is sort of doing some of this actor and power mapping also. I think this is a very important thing that we need to be doing as well. And then to your first question, I, that's absolutely right about the empirics. Quantifying this very messy qualitative space is very tricky and just taking like averages of counts and things like that. Even you know, normalizing helps a little bit. But you know, maybe you have one, you have 99 mentions of bias, and then one mention says, and we're going to ban all of such and such. So they're not, you know, strictly comparable. Uh, I still think roughly it's giving you an, an overall story of things that people care about. Um, I did do some sub-analyses where I, uh, for example, subset to the five most important documents that have the, the most wide-ranging scope, are the most normative in terms of shaping actual policy, to see if they were uh, any different. But I think it's quite right. Uh, one of the challenges in this space is how do you statistically measure policy documents and power and influence and things like that? So some attempts here, but a lot, a lot more work to be done there. Yeah, but really, I really thanks for those questions. Yeah, so 
I guess I was sort of similar question about like looking at these sort of more fine-grained versions of this thing. Um, I would expect, you mentioned this thing called the No Ro Robot Bosses Act, mm -hmm. uh, which I would expect to have all ethical language. And the Kill Human Workers Act, I would expect to be like all traditional language. Uh, and like, so have, have you looked in these sorts of, um, this kind of fine grained thing where it's like, uh, mm -hmm. you know, I guess the distinction is between those two different sorts of policies. Um, and do you see more ethical language in one type of document and more traditional language in another? So great question. Okay, yeah, so, so no robot bosses, Bob Casey in Pennsylvania, and then a bunch of other ones that are very economic development oriented. Uh, so I haven't done a, a robust analysis of, of legislation. So these were executive documents. Part of the logic was they're kind of more neutral. They're not trying to, uh, uh, to credit claim or cheap talk the way that legislators do with their titles and their speeches doesn't mean that they're not really important uh, signals of agenda and power and things like that. So I haven't done this yet, but I think you know, he uh, hearings and legislation are really important to do. And there's a couple people who are starting to do some of this. Uh, my lab is putting together with a, with a, a lab at Georgetown, uh, the AI governance and regulatory archive. So currently we have all past federal legislation uh, and next we're doing, we're starting to add in state level legislation uh, and then coding different categories. What are, the, what are the problems and the risks and the harms and the policy solutions? Based on some of that, we should be able to get something like more uh, comprehensive understanding of uh, the style of you know, congressional documents or, or documents put forward by uh, people from one party or the other party. Uh, so we're making progress there, but yeah, we have a lot of great uh, data on, you know, from, from legislation that needs to be, uh, we need to use you know, natural language techniques and more qualitative coding. Uh, but yeah, so roughly the, my anecdotal sense is that documents coming from Congress, certainly Twitter messages, uh, much more uh, performative, if you will. Uh, the, I mentioned that some of the big bills that came out, I want to say the House's bill mentioned China 900 times and the Senate's bill mentioned it only 156 times or something like that. Uh, so uh, a different approach, less kind of neutrally positioned. Um, but yeah, I think definitely there, there should be follow-up work, and I know some students who are doing stuff trying to you know, dive into this more and uh, compare across different you know, sectors and levels. So I'll take that as a good charge. Uh, thank you for that. Thanks so much for your talk. I'm really looking forward to invoking your work in my term paper for my public policy course, of course. Um, so I guess, I guess I'm wondering, during your research, or even since uh, you completed it for this paper, uh, were there any partisan conflicts regarding any policy that you identified? And if so, how the associated causal stories on each side would tell, so you know, like, who are they assigning blame to, who are they framing as the problem solvers? How do those differ between uh, each party? Yeah, because it's a great question. Uh, and this is such a, such a dynamic space. Uh, so also working on a paper now looking at a state level AI policy and the, it's something about the prospects for polarization. So right now it's been very bipartisan. Everybody in the US wants to innovate and to outcompete China and protect rights. And there's you know, task forces, Republicans, Democrats. Um, when we were up in, in the Hill in November, October with the Senate AI task force, we had uh, uh, a Republican and Democratic senators you know, there with us. Um, so, so in this particular study, we're looking at state level policy and there's stuff you, you might expect and there's stuff that you, you know, maybe wouldn't expect. So I'm gonna say Illinois, Colorado, their legislation, there are fault lines that might emerge for uh, areas that traditionally have partisan connections. So if you have criminal justice and facial recognition and you attach that to a, a, a lens of racial bias, then you might start to get cleavages. But we have other cases where there are existing industry actors. Uh, so uh, I wanna say, uh, I forget if it was Colorado or Illinois, but the legislation looking at pre-trial uh, risk assessment algorithms. So these algorithms would be used to say, you're a flight risk or you're not, we're gonna let you out of jail uh, if we think you're not, not too high risk. Uh, now the companies that were making these tools didn't want that auditing to happen. Uh, the cash bail lobby, they did want that to happen. 
because they didn't want the, these new AI entrants coming in. And this led to some you know, bipartisan agreement, and in some cases for kind of thin regulation. So yeah, let's, we're, we're gonna tell people an algorithm's being used and they're gonna send a basic transparency report. We're not gonna ban it or do anything intensive, but everybody can agree on kind of light touch, you know, transparency and documentation. Um, so, you know, in some cases, I think we're, we're starting to see potential cleavages emerge. Other cases, you know, labor disruption, what's gonna happen there. Um, so I'm happy to share you this paper as we're sort of putting it together. We used kind of a, a problems, solutions, policy sectors or subsystems and stakeholders to say, uh, oh, you know, these policy domains are highly polarized or immigration or whatever. Uh, the autonomous vehicles, not that polarized. Uh, these policy problems, uh, uh, freedom and trust, everybody likes that. Uh, racial bias, you know, that's more controversial. So depending on the extent to which policy entrepreneurs successfully attach uh, AI policy issues in very different domains to different problems or solutions, or this is a criminal justice problem, or this is a data rights problem, I think we'll start to see some of those cleavages emerge more. But it's still very, yeah, very dynamic story, still trying to wrap my head around it, presenting this at a conference next week, and welcome feedback that you have. But uh, I'm forgetting the, the person who titled this document. But within his bio bioethics course that I'm currently TAing for, mm -hmm. um, a regulatory paradigm within sort of like informed consent, uh, the way it was initially regulated was to protect doctors and medical institutions from being sued. It right. was not to really genuinely promote autonomy and, and uh, patient protection or in, like genuine informed consent in, in, in that nature. I'm curious, as you're reviewing these documents, are they coming out in more of that kind of mm -hmm. pragmatic sense for companies and it's protecting industry, like they're begging for regulation to be clear so they can avoid lawsuits? Or is it in a more sort of uh, robust sense that they are taking, whether or not mm -hmm. it's the traditional approach or the transformative approach, which uh, I was hopeful to hear was get a better representation here, but it doesn't sound like it's happening. Um, <laughs> Are they, you know, is there a change there? Is there at least like the regulations are more robust? Are they really more sort of protective to industry? Yeah, it's another great question. Um, so, so right, so there's some awareness of how regulation of social media didn't go that well and we don't want to repeat that. There's awareness of things like uh, 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 the general data protection regulation, GDPR in Europe and how that hasn't been perfect to say, to say the least. We have this notice and consent regime where now we all just sort of click okay and that's, but it, it has done some stuff, not as much as, as uh, you know, many people uh, would like. So there's awareness that maybe we don't wanna do this stuff again. I would say early legislation uh, or, or documents, not even in enough detail to tell whether it's a check the box exercise or robust action. But if we fast forward a little bit to some of the stuff that when the big AI companies had to go before Congress and they said, we're gonna get audited and things like that. I think this is very much in negotiation. So they'll say, you know, we're gonna audit ourselves. Um, and, you know, Biden says, great, you know, you're gonna audit yourselves, it needs to be robust. Um, and then we get a little bit more pressure. Is, is this auditing gonna play out in a, in, a, in a powerful and effective way? Or are we gonna get independent, you know, third party uh, auditing? And there is this kind of interesting uh, AI ethics and governance auditing ecosystem that's emerging. A lot are just sort of startups that are saying, oh, we'll do a bias test of your systems. Some of them are the big consulting firms, BCG, PwC, will do you know, algorithmic auditing for you. Right now it's closer to consulting, uh, so it's not arm's length, uh, standard, you know, clear metrics. But you know, organizations like IEEE, uh, Responsible AI Institute, are trying to come up with certification criteria to make this more formalized and serious. Uh, so yes, yeah, so same answer, unfortunately, I wish I had more definitive. I think it's still a contest of, of uh, uh, you know, power and how formal each of these tests will be. Some of it has indeed been thin regulation for now. So as you, as you suggested, you know, well, one reason that we might get bipartisan agreement about uh, facial recognition legislation. We're, we just, you know, tell people if you're using AI in a video interview. Well, we can all agree on that, right? Well, we can agree on it because we want at least that 
and you don't want any more than that. And maybe if we pass that bill, uh, New York Automated Employment Decision Tool, whatever it is, the, the Illinois Video Interview Act, maybe that says we've basically done enough and now we, we have permission to use these tools. So there's different reasons the parties are agreeing on this. So I, so I would say for now it started off thin, getting more expansive is going to be part of a lot of you know, ongoing contestation. Yeah. Just to follow up on the, uh, the window dressing question, in all the documents that you read, right, they, they put ethics in the mission statement, but is there any serious discussions of ethical principles that should be applied to the AI field? And because I'm wondering, is it because it's very difficult to come up with consensus on the ethical principle, that's why they chose not to deal with it? Yeah, I mean, I would say there is serious discussion and I do take a lot of these people to, to think these are serious and important issues. Um, so they won't just say ethics is important, one sentence. They'll talk bias, transparency, privacy, power concentration. They'll list a lot of uh, concepts that the AI ethics community has been carefully building out and doing research on. So there's awareness of the issues and you know, they would seem to value them. They just don't have a lot of detail about what to do about them. Uh, so, and I, I think you know, a couple slides. I had this. You know, maybe they're, maybe they're, the solutions aren't technically feasible. We want to protect human rights, but what are we going to do? Uh, there's proposals to do human rights impact assessments. What are those going to consist of? That's not detailed enough. That there were required. You know, every agency now has to do a human rights impact assessment. We didn't know what to do there, or they didn't know what to do there. So I, I would say they do take it seriously. They do get into some level of detail about the nature of the problems. But then when they lose detail and action, it's when they have you know, concrete recommendations and solutions, which there's a few possible interpretations of that. Yeah, which you know, could be in, uh, uh, you know, window dressing or it could be we just don't know what to do here or, uh, or some of both. Yeah. Um, yeah, thanks for the talk, that was really fun. So I think your big, um, what are your big takeaways to be from sort of this, your data set 2016 through 2020? We're seeing within American policy a lot of this traditionalist stuff, not much transformative stuff. Here you gesture on your last slide that maybe generative AI is going to move us more in the transformative direction. Um, but I was curious if you could just speculate on other maybe international perspectives and if whether you see Europe or other countries, not that you have to know about all of them, but if you see any trends, how whether the US approach seems common within the international community or whether we're an outlier or if you have any thoughts on international comparative stuff. Yeah, that's a great question. So the traditional, excuse me again, way of, of thinking about this is uh, the European Union is more precautionary and they're protecting ethics and human rights. The US is more pro-innovation. Uh, China is regulating industry but has exemptions for the government. And most other countries are sort of choosing between the US and EU model. That's sort of how, oh, Brazil, it's doing the US thing. The UK, it's going the US direction. Or will it be somewhere in the middle? Um, I think that's you know, br you know, broadly still right. Um, even though we have a remarkable amount of US documents and initiatives, like the AI Bill of Rights is an amazing document. It's really thoughtful. It's some of the best careful work on AI ethics. Uh, so a lot of, a lot of the, the thinkers and civil society groups are coming out of, out of the US, but still I think you know, innovation is, is winning out. I did see, however, a student's dissertation I was reviewing, uh, you know, finally did the five-year version of my study, where, or, or they were able to bring it to 2022 or 2023 uh, and, and look at a, an early period and a late period, and they found that there was convergence. So the EU was becoming more pro-innovation in its documents, and the US was becoming more pro-social in its documents. And I thought that was, uh, you know, if that finding continues to be supported, uh, then you know, may maybe we are seeing some kind of alignment and directions. Um, but yeah, and there are some countries, so the, 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 uh, the Balto-Slavic region, they have you know, especially progressive documents. There's interesting ones like India's national strategy where they've articulated, it's a hashtag AI for all. They wanna be the, the hub of the global south and they have different policy priorities. Um, so there is variation, but still pretty much all of them are, we'll say we want innovation, we want more computer scientists, a lot of similarities between the documents. Um, yeah, so that those would be the international observations I'd have. Yeah, thanks for the question. Yes, um, I have a few thoughts, so excuse me for looking down yeah, go for it. my notes. Um, 
You mentioned the um, in your study the the number of mentions between experts and the public. Um, and of course, this is this is an analysis of government documents in regards to AI, and therefore the government's use of AI, but also the government regulating AI. Um, and and I, I think of one of my favorite quotes from George Washington that alludes to um, butchering it, I'm sure. Um, but we didn't give up the uniform of the civilian when we put on the uniform of the soldier. And I, I wonder, huh. far be it from high-ranking military officials, politicians, and overstimulated bureaucrats to call themselves experts, but how much of a separation do you feel there may be between these experts forgetting their role as the civilian? Um, Hmm. And is there any, you know, did you find any mentions in those government documents about perhaps even the concern of the public's use of AI governing the government? Um, you know, is there, does there appear to be a fear or a plan that's mentioned in these, I recognize, likely, unlikely, um, as, seeing as they're public, um, but, you know, did you find anything about that, or, or perhaps what that distinction between an expert in AI ethics is compared to the menial, silly publics. Can you clarify this, the second part about experts' fear of the public using AI? Or uh, well, I that? guess there, there, I, I see a weird distinction there in such an early, uh, you know, un unmatured field um, to, for people to perhaps preemptively calling themselves experts. Um, and is that, it, do you see that as an unhealthy separation? So you, you, that's actually quite uh, some interesting provocative questions here. Um, so let's see. So one is, uh, I would say for expert usage here is pretty, pretty broad. It's probably closer to elite. So if you're government or industry, you're an elite. You may or may not be an AI expert. More people are, um, but it's really between the people who traditionally have power and the members of the public who may not have power. Um, in some of the public attitudes and survey research that, that we do and other people have done, um, we found that uh, legislators are closer to members of the public in terms of their views, very different from the views of, 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 of quote, AI experts, computer scientists who publish in top journals. So in many ways, legislators were, or state legislators have been uh, new to this stuff too. Uh, so in terms of their baseline attitudes and support for things, though they're, they're upscaling quickly. The idea of, you know, you know, I'm a bureaucrat, I'm a member of Congress, I'm supposed to be representing the public, I am a member of the public, this is, you know, uh, you know for the people, by the people. Um, yeah, you know, I, I, I think there is a disconnect. I think uh, the, we would traditionally think in political science, the incentives of, of you know, members of Congress are quite different. They're, they're thinking about re-election, you know, very often. Um, you know, we hope that our elected officials are thinking about the, the public charge and their mission to the public, but we, we worry that this isn't always the case. Uh, I would think, stereotypically, uh, 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 career servants, public servants in the executive agencies may be a little bit closer to thinking about their public mission, though they still have budgets they're trying to preserve and careers they're trying to build. Uh, but yeah, no, I, I, I I think it would be a great situation if we sort of felt our, our, our bureaucrats, our representatives, they are the people and they're enacting our will. But I, I think that a lot of people feel, and it's probably not unfair to say that they are not necessarily capturing what the, the public might care about or what's in the public's interest always. So if you do end up in the situation where a lot of big industry players are in all the meetings and they're shaping all the decisions, uh, then, then you're, you're not capturing that or, or even understanding what the public will is or, or creating the environment to even be able to understand the public will. Uh, but it's a, great, it's a great question. I'll have to think about that more. Yeah, I just find that even just the use of experts and the public influences some of the data and the perception. Yeah, yeah. Perhaps creates a bias to the person viewing the data. Yeah, yeah, okay. So, um, 
uh, we might, I mean, one of the reasons that we value the public's opinion here, to still use that term, is we think that they're experts on their own experiences and their own challenges. I'm forgetting the term now, but they're kind of epistemic experts on their own things, and that's why their opinions are valued. Uh, in this sort of latest paper up here, I'm looking at whether uh, members of the public are able to influence policymakers when they send out social media messages to policymakers pick up those media messages in a you know, subsequent time period. Um, and the thought here was if the policymakers are going to listen to the public, it will be on social and ethical issues where we think the public has a stake and special expertise and experience. They're probably not going to listen to the public on military matters. They're going to listen to the experts on that. Uh, found in this study anyways that the public does listen, uh, policymakers do listen to the public, but not on social and ethical issues, um, on innovation. Um, so maybe it confirms some of their priors there. But no, I, I agree. Um, uh, the public is thought of as valuable. It does, it, it does have expertise here, but there's a lot we need to sort of work out to utilize their perspectives to engage them more, more effectively. I appreciate the point. Yeah. That, that's a lot of weight. Uh, so, so let's say let's say the window, the, the the window that we want an opportunity. Let's say the window's sticky right now, and ten years from now, fifteen years from now, the window's still open. Uh, what can we do as educators of the people who will be moving into decision making roles? Uh, so, you uh, mentioned earlier in a conversation we had about uh, the particular uh, the particular. Um, requirements on you to teach uh, about transformative texts in addition to, to doing other things. What, um, what opportunities are there in public universities uh, to engage our students in ways that we have even more people predisposed to be thinking about ethics 15 years from now if the window hasn't closed? Really, really carefully. Okay, so great question. Y'all have asked a lot of great and difficult questions, and I hope you continue to think about them and come up with, with better answers than me. So, okay, so what can we do as educators? Um, so there's a, there's a lot of progress to be made on ethics education, on computing ethics education. Uh, some of this is more embedded ethics across programming, thinking about not just you've learned the prominent normative frameworks, but what actually happens when you get into an applied setting and your boss says do X. Uh, so what are, what are real life decisions and what changes in things like moral sensitivity and obligation can actually change your behavior? So I think we really need to you know, amplify our ethics education. Um, this is not just computer scientists and engineers, right? This is now many of us, most of us will go into, you'll be a public administrator, you'll be a marketer, and you'll have some choice about procuring these tools and adopting these tools. And when you design them, is there human oversight? Is there remediation? So I think the opportunity for, for students to take these kinds of classes, almost whatever sector they're in, and think about how it plays out in their job role. These would be great opportunities for many students. Um, we're trying to build out that kind of programming. Um, interdisciplinary work and well-designed. So I think I have, I have a paper called Explaining the Principles to Practices Gap, and it makes some recommendations for higher education. Amongst them is, can we get computer scientists and design students and policy scientists in the same room and do joint impact assessments of AI systems. Uh, so not just we're doing our one technical algorithmic bias test, can we create co-taught multidisciplinary uh, arenas where students are really learning to communicate with each other the way that we know is, is really hard to foster across disciplinary lines unless you practice other people's language for a long time. So building that in a lot more intentionally, giving them hands-on experience of doing robust socio-technical impact assessments, not just a, you know, fairness and privacy, uh, giving them connections to industry or civil society, internships in government where they can really test this out. So you know, practical skills uh, you know, Im embedded uh, for real world settings. Um, some of the things that we, we call for, public participation, diverse, interdisciplinary, we need ethicists on these teams to enable all of the stuff we're calling for. We have to design for it. I think that'll be a, a, a important and interesting challenge. Yeah. Wonderful. Right. That's all if you ask me. So thank you so much, okay. Daniel. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.